little bit? Okay. Uh, a little bit more further away. How's that? Okay? Good. Uh, I wanted you to know what these pictures are are actually underwater shots from the harbor. So this is all from Wine Harbor, all from the area within the 100 acres that uh, the area which we're looking to net off. So all of these are underwater pictures that have been part of the survey work we've been doing. So I just wanted you to have a sense of, so you know why they were up there and what we've been seeing. Mike's still okay, it's a little scratchy, but just you can hear me? Good, okay, good. So Matt, if you could now do something so we're looking at something else would be helpful. But I have to have Matt do that, because if I do it, you'll never see anything. you all for coming. It's been a while since uh, Lori and I have been here. We've been here separately, we've been here together, but this time we've actually got quite a crew of our team here and want to make sure that we have the opportunity to introduce some new people to you. The purpose of this evening is really to certainly, as we've done before, is to bring you up to date on um, what we're doing, how things are going, what are some of the challenges, what are things, things that are easy. Also tonight, we're going to talk some about the whales, some about who are the whales that are really around the world that are most in need, and we'll talk some about some that we've just been dealing with directly. But with that, I want to introduce two of our newest staff members. You know, of course, Lori, our founder and director. She's not new. But also, you know Amy, who is there in the back, who is whale girl, and who obviously we rely on for everything. But part of what we need to do as an organization is build our capacity to do more. So certainly you've also met Catherine Kinsman at many of these meetings, our beluga expert from here in Nova Scotia who's worked with all the lone belugas for so long. But most recently we've added Alexandra Vance as our project manager here in Nova Scotia. Alexandra has a master's degree in marine science. She's a diver, she's also a surfer but uh, has done quite a bit of work. She was doing some diving while those pictures were taking place. And she's on the site all the time, really trying to move things forward in Nova Scotia in all of the ways that we have work that we have to do. We've also most recently added uh, Matthew Barenas as our deputy director. So Matt is coming in really in the Whale Sanctuary Project in the US to help build the capacity of the organization for fundraising for our communication. He's a filmmaker, he has a master's degree as well in animal science, but really he's a communications expert and really someone who can step up to fill all of the areas when I'm running around the world doing weird things and when Lori's busy doing other stuff. So really this is about building the capacity of the organization to really be able to handle not only everything we have to do here, but some of the other work that we're doing elsewhere that I think is also important for you to hear more about. So we'll go through all of that in the next little while. Uh, we'll all chime in, we can all answer questions, and really this is again to have a conversation with you, but we want to give you enough context with some of the new things so that you can have questions that are based on what we're most recently doing. So with that, let me turn it back to Lori, and you can go from there. I'll just tell me when you want to respond. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being here. You know, we thought, that maybe tonight we would sort of return to why we're doing this. Who are the animals that prompt us to work every day for them? And what is their prompt? What is their plight? And, and so, as you know, the Well Sanctuary Project was created because um, there are many, many dolphins and whales living in concrete tanks in impoverished environments forced to perform, dying early, um, showing abnormal behaviors because they really don't belong in that environment. They suffer in that environment. And what we want to do is take those two pictures up top of the beluga whale 
and the orca and turn their environment into the picture below. From a tank painted blue with nothing in it to a beautiful bay with creatures and complexity in it that you, we just showed you on the slides. So this is uh, Port Hilford and we're looking at it uh, going out to the ocean as Bearshaw Island and it shows the area that we are working to create a, a, a 100 acre sanctuary for beluga whales and or orcas. And just from looking at that, you can see how different their life would be living there versus in the tanks that they currently live in. Now, there are a lot of cetaceans or dolphins and whales in captivity around the world. We're not doing this just for a few. We're doing this because we want to uh, create a change that will allow other people to create new sanctuaries in this way in the future. Children will not go to near marine parks to see orcas flipping up and down or, or beluga whales or dolphins doing tricks. Um, they'll know that they belong in the ocean. Um, and so, but there are a lot of them. There are about 3,000 to 3,500 whales, dolphins, and porpoises in captivity around the world. We don't have the exact numbers because there's so many in areas where they don't report. Um, North America, there are about 400, there's actually 480 bottlenose dolphins now, 65 belugas and 18 orcas. In marine land of Canada in Ottawa, as you know, there are lots and lots of belugas, 30, 35, we don't really know the exact number. Um, what we do know is that these animals are dying in the tanks. 176 orcas have already died in captivity over the past few years. And as far as how many belugas have died, that number is far greater. Uh, so these are animals who don't belong where they are. They're suffering, they're dying, they're not able to lead the life that they were meant to live. And we want to change that scenario for them. So what, what we've been doing past, uh, well, since the beginning, but especially now, we started to look for candidate orcas and belugas who might actually be candidates for coming to our sanctuary when we complete it. And I want to introduce you to some of them just to give you an idea of what, who they are, um, what their lives are like, um, we're engaged um, with trying to see if there's a path forward to bring any of these individuals to our sanctuary. So the ones on top, the 30, 30, 30 35 believers are at Marineland, Canada. We would still like to, and we still are holding out hope for a continued conversation with that facility so that we can see if there's a way some of them at least can come to our sanctuary. Um, there is a, a family, uh, you can see on the bottom, a family of four orcas living in marine land in Antibes in France. And they're a family, and their names are Wiki, Inuk, Mona, and Kiju. And they've been together, obviously, their whole lives. But they may actually go off to a place in China. And if that happens, they will break the family up. Which to an orca is about the worst thing that can happen because they're so family oriented. Um, and we're trying to see if there's any path forward for them. Then we've got um, Bella and Movi. They are two young female beluga whales who are living in in uh, South Korea. And they, um, we have been in talks for the past couple of years actually with 
the folks there to see, again, if there's a, a path forward for these two beluga whales uh, to come to our sanctuary and get out of the tanks. Um, there's also three beluga whales in Taiwan, you can see on the right. And then there's a lone orca named Shemank, who is in a place called Mungo Marino in Argentina. So this is just a sample of some of the individuals who we're hoping might be among candidates for the sanctuary. They need us. Can you talk a little bit about the solar down as well? Yeah. So just going back, part of what I think is important for, at least for us to understand, I think for you as well, how is it that we end up designating any of these as candidates for a whale sanctuary? It comes from, first of all, why have we selected these? These are among the six or eight animals most in need around the world. Also, they're in parks that are in transition. So the park owners are people with whom, in some cases, we've already had conversations, in others, we're looking to do. So with Marine Land Canada, and that's a park that many of you have visited, that had another orca that passed away this past year. It's had a lot of issues with animal welfare and the like, and we've had conversations with the owner's representative over the years. There are now, as Lori mentioned, roughly 35 belugas. Sounds like a lot, and it is. But two years ago, they had 59. Five of them went to an aquarium in Connecticut. Two died immediately. One is in critical condition, and two are doing reasonably well. 59 minus five is 54, and there are 35 or so. What happened to the other 19? And that's the thing you don't necessarily know, and we don't know, but what it underscores is that these animals are having difficulty where they are. The park is also for sale. It's about 800 acres of land. They have bears, they have all kinds of animals. And they're looking to find what do they do with all of these animals if they're able to sell the park. So that's a discussion that while we don't have current conversations with Greenland Canada, they've not been open to them, that is a conversation we would like to have because these belugas are in such need. And we have Honorable Wilfred Moore here, who's on our board of the Whale Sanctuary of Canada. He's also, as many of you may know, the father of the Free Willy Bill, the Bill S203 in the Canadian Parliament that outlawed keeping whales and dolphins in captivity in Canada, but of course grandfathered in those that were still here. The arc of the story in our minds, and I think you've heard me say this before, we have S203, the bill in Canada, that really is leading in many respects the country and the world in how these animals should be treated. We have the potential for a sanctuary here, and the arc of that narrative, if we were able to bring belugas from the one remaining place in Canada where belugas are held, would be, in my mind, and I think in a lot of yours, a beautiful story that could be a story for the world to see how change can happen. So that's why they are still among our highest priorities. Then you have these four orcas in, in France, and they're in Marine One France. That tank happens to be leaking right now. So the government is closing down or forcing that to close. So these animals will be moved. But the problem is if they're moved to China or Japan, Japan is a likely spot for them. The families, because of the size of the parks and the aquarium in Japan, would be separated. So ideally, you would not want to separate those animals. So this is just gives you a sense of behind the scenes, the conversations that are going on with Bella and Lundy. The South Korean government has made the same determination. They're outlawing keeping these animals in aquaria and marine parks. So they've moved some dolphins, and now these two aquaria have been in contact and they would like to move them here. It's quite a distance to come. There's all kinds of logistic issues. There's timing issues, but all of that 
leads to them being the primary candidates. We're just beginning the conversations in Taiwan. We don't know a whole lot about those animals other than that they have been reaching out to colleagues of ours to see if there's a possibility for them. Shemank's a different story. Shemank is an Argentinian orca. He was captured in Argentina. He's in Argentina. The likelihood of him being moved out of Argentina, personally, I don't think is a good idea, but also is very difficult. So I, in terms of where do we stand on these, Shemank is not likely a candidate. But we wanted to give you a sense of the personality, if you will, of some of the animals. They're real. They exist. They have personal stories. And that's what leads us to really try to move forward with them in this way. And what's the secret of all of it is having an open, trustworthy, and transparent conversation with the owners. Now, almost never do we and the owners agree on everything. Because obviously, they're in a different business than we're talking about. But in order for a whale to be moved, whether it's an orca or beluga, we have to find common ground to be able to meet with those owners and agree on a strategy for their animals, because they do own them, technically and legally, to be moved. And that's the process that we're just getting into with certain places. And if you have more questions about it, we've just been through it with the Miami Seaquarium, with uh, uh, the orca that was longest in captivity there, Wawita, she was 57 years old. She passed away four weeks ago, and we were caring for her for the last 18 months, and she had been in that park for 53 years. So what we did there was found a way to talk with the owners, and they allowed us to come in and bring caregivers and veterinarians to work with them. And I think that's a model for how we will end up working with some of these organizations that already are in conversation with some. So I just wanted to give you some really background about all of that. Thanks, Charles. And I think, you know, that's one of the things is that we, we do want to be a model all the way through the group. Not just for procuring animals, but also for how we care for them. And for the past couple of years, we've been working with two other organizations that created sanctuary. Uh, Sea Life Trust, which is an arm of Merlin Entertainment, and the National Aquarium in Baltimore, in the United States. We got together and we worked together for a couple years. We created the first set of guidelines for accrediting cetacean sanctuaries. There's an organization called the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, it's the only one in the world, and they go around and they accredit. They check out and accredit animal sanctuaries to make sure that the animals are under good care and that it's an actual authentic sanctuary. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that just a couple months ago, uh, we uh, published uh, our document with the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. And it represents a real a, a progressive step because it would be the first sanctuary accreditation guidelines for cetaceans. And it also means that we were able to work with other organizations like the National Aquarium um, towards a single goal, which is to figure out what is best for the animals. And so we're very proud of that. And then I just want to go back to thinking about this in terms of reshaping our relationship with cetaceans. I know that's why I started this, is to think about, is there another way to relate to these animals rather than just put them in tanks and watch them eat them? And I think there is. What we want to create is a sanctuary that's a place not just to live, but to thrive, where the residents, the whales, their well-being is a priority, nothing else, nothing else. But this is all about giving back to them. No performances, what I like to call no super pet tricks, um, no breeding, no making more animals in captivity, no unnecessary invasive procedures, where we promote their autonomy, their chance to actually choose how they spend their day, just like you and me. 
um, and have as natural a life as possible. It's also a place where we can do education about the animals, about conservation, and share data. I mean, this is so exciting because the, the change we can make in the minds of the new generations coming up about how they relate to these animals is really exciting, has a lot of potential. And of course, it would have, it is, will be sustainable with the environment and located in a community that embraces the sanctuary mission. As you know, Charles and I spent a long time looking for a site and we were embraced uh, by the Sherbrooke community and that made a big difference to us and uh, we continue to be grateful uh, for that. So now I want to turn things back over to Charles who's going to tell you a little bit about what's been going on. Thanks, Mark. So I think as most of you know, we've been at this a long time. I think I was talking with some of you earlier and they said, you know, is this ever going to happen? It's a good question. It's also the right question and we ask it of ourselves as well because I don't think any one of us thought that when we started in 2020, when we first, I think it was February of 2020, when we announced this site, uh, that it would take this long to get through all of the steps that we have. What I can say is, although you may not believe me anymore, is that we are making progress. We are moving forward on all the areas that we need to, the most important of which really have been kind of the environmental work that we've had to do. But this kind of depiction of what it takes to break ground. How do you get to break, breaking ground? So the big pieces have certainly been the community. And we've been, as Laurie says, tremendously grateful for you and your neighbors who have embraced this project in a positive way, have great questions, have serious questions that we understand and we'll have to work through, but in fact have generally been tremendously supportive of the idea of the mission, even when there are questions that are personal for each and every, for some of you, the mission has never been one that I don't think has been questioned at all. So that underscores why it's the right place. But we have all of the government work that you have to do. So the government work really falls into two categories. One of them is leasing. So the area of Wine Harbor, or Hilford Bay, that we are leasing for the water space that we would net off, is a lease from the Department of natural resources and renewables. That lease has actually been provided, it's been granted. That doesn't mean it's finalized, it means it's been granted. And so that's for 205 acres of water space within which there would be 100 acres netted off and the rest of that other 105 acres is buffer zone, it's where the anchors go and the like. It includes Barishwa Island which is owned by Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. So that's part of that lease. And then the lease has terms and conditions that have to be met. I'll come back to those in a bit. So we haven't met all of the terms and conditions, but we have been issued the lease. Then there are also permits that are needed from the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables and the Department of Environment and Transport Canada. Those are the three primary ones. Transport Canada has basically signed off on the project. They don't see navigational issues from their perspective. Department of Environment is still looking at certain aspects of where's their eelgrass. You've been out there and you've dove that area, we got a lot of eelgrass. So in this province and in Canada generally, you have to avoid impacts on eelgrass. So that determines where do you run your net anchors where do you run anything that's going to come in contact with that eelgrass? Or if you do impact it, how do you offset that impact by planting eelgrass elsewhere or doing restoration? Those are all ways that you go through that permit process. Then you also have all of the environmental permitting. So you, those of you who live in the area and the like, you've seen we've been doing all kinds of excavation on the 30 acres of land that we have under contract adjacent to the water. That's private land that we have under option to purchase. The funds for that are in escrow. So we're waiting to get through all the process to exercise our option 
on the 30 acres. We dug pits, we ducted all of it. You all know that this is an old gold mining area. So obviously there's concern about what are the heavy metals in that dirt area? Can they be dealt with? Can they be mitigated? And the like. So you have that environment on the land. You also have the same questions for the submerged soil because certainly runoff from that land had been running off since the 1880s to the 1930s when those mines were active. So we've also been looking at what's the condition of the submerged soil. So with that, just one little story about why it takes so long is, and I think some of you have heard this story before, we applied for the permit to take 18 core samples, roughly the size of a water bottle, 18 of those in the submerged soil in April of 2022. We received the permit to actually take the 18 samples in August of 2023. So that was 15, 18 months from when we applied to when we got it. In the interim, we also had to do some archeological review for part of the indigenous consultation in the area. That actually took the least amount of time, but we did that as well. So all of that work has now been completed. When we think about what are those environmental studies, it's an environmental site assessment one, an environmental site assessment two, and now with the submerged soil, an environmental site assessment three. So we're basically done with those environmental studies. Now we're evaluating the results. What we can say is that throughout that area, there are certainly issues of residue from the gold mining, which is not a surprise. Everyone told us about that from day one, and we've known it. And there are ways the province has approved mitigating or reviewing and developing such sites. So on land, you cap such sites. You put a layer of dirt, gravel, or concrete where you're doing a building site. In the submerged soil, you either do some excavation or you, you remove certain residue if it's there. We don't yet know all of what's in the submerged soils, but what we do know where we have the mines themselves on the 30 acres of land, the old stamp mill that was there and the like, all of that area, already with the Department of Environment, there's a mitigation plan that works for that. So these are not insurmountable problems. They're problems that exist throughout the province for development, and you have to use the same measures of mitigation for development in order to proceed. So that's what we're now in the process of, that step of developing those mitigation standards, meeting with the departments to make sure they're approved, and seeing how we finance all of that work. None of it, there are no showstoppers, if you will, but there are certainly problems to solve that we're working through from all of this work. The First Nation consultation is also still ongoing. It's not complete. That's been, let's see, started October of 2022. So it's now roughly been underway for a full year. There are certain studies we had to fund. There's one company in Canada, in, in the province that's approved to do these studies. It's member to Geomatics. So they did their study. They finished that. They submitted it to KMKNO. They're reviewing it and we'll have meetings with them again this week while we're here. But that consultation process is government to government. So it's the Mi'kmaq government to the provincial government, and we are the proponent, but we're not actually at the table between the two parties. They're at the table discussing the project with the studies we funded for them to review it with. So that process is also ongoing. So where are we? We're getting through it. But it's certainly not a clear path. In most cases, the agencies don't know what to do with us because they've never been asked to, pro to permit a project of this nature. But in the main, they're certainly cordial. They're slow. Many of them are still not back in their offices. As someone was talking earlier, when you call them up, you do hear the baby crying in the background. You hear the dog barking. You know they're at home. Things have changed. And that is a difference in how we work through it. I think it's slower, but the process is still the same. And we just have to work our way through it. 
So these just, this just gives you a sense of the kinds of studies we have done over the last two years. We've been doing consistently temperature and pressure. We do water quality analyses all the time, seasonally throughout each of the seasons to make sure we do it. We've done a hydrodynamic model of the whole bay to show us how in storms and regular weather, the waves and the currents move through the area. Why? To know how it flushes, to know how it will react, to know how the nets will be moved, how the anchors may be moved. All of that comes from the hydrodynamic studies. It also shows us how the area will flush because as we talked before, whales poop. And so you want to make sure the area flushes naturally. And this is a very vibrant area, one that does move the currents through the area well. And we, we don't see any problems with that. But that also dictates how many animals you would choose to put in a sanctuary. So you've heard us talk before, roughly eight animals is what we see. Eight belugas, seven, nine, eight, roughly you don't know the age, but roughly eight is what we've talked about. And if it were orcas, then you have to balance that out. Certainly orcas and belugas can never be in the same netted area. They have to be separated or you have to have one species or the other. And you make that determination, again, based on the need, based on the animals that become available and the timing that works for us. So all of those are the kinds of studies that have gone on to date. And then just some pictures of the most recent ones. I mentioned the excavation we've been doing on the land side, on the 30 acres. These are some of the sediment samples, the pits that have been, have been dug the analyses of the groundwater, all of that is part of what has gone on to date as part of the ESA 2, and again, most recently on the groundwater as part of the ESA 3. And then most recently, the in-water samples for the 18 core samples. We've also taken other samples while we've been doing that, as well as the pictures. You can see in the upper right corner, your upper right corner, that's the beautiful eelgrass that we've got throughout the area. We have quite a bit of that in various parts around the submerged soils. And then certainly, as all of you know from Whale Girl and all the work that Amy does and that now Alexander has been helping with, tremendous number of community projects throughout the whole area. Not only in the Sherbrooke, Hawaiian Harbor, Port Hilford area, but also we've been in Lunenburg for Ocean Week, also in Halifax, River Days, which we've been at every year, Hope for Wildlife. Uh, we've been a thing and uh, uh, exhibitor at Hope for Wildlife each of the last two years. And in each of those years, the booth that Amy and most recently Alexandra helped with was designated as the most popular booth in all of uh, the Hope for Wildlife events. So that's fun as well. And then just this past Saturday, yesterday, two days ago, whatever day, it was Monday, the South Shore Sustainability Summit in Bridgewater that uh, Alexandra was at and represented as well and spoke at as well. So a lot of community work, just pictures of all the kind of wonderful things that you see in the back and that Amy has been uh, become famous for doing around this community. And without her, we certainly wouldn't be able to do any of this. So we're grateful for that. So just coming back to, to really what we wanted to impart today, and then we'll just open this up to questions. It really is about the others. There's almost nothing you can do if you're in touch with these animals when they need you, that you don't feel you must do something to help them. It's, I've had that experience most recently, it's hard to talk about, with Lolita in, in Florida. And that animal, oldest animal in captivity, smallest tank anywhere in the world. And yet when you visit her the first time, when she's well, She's not suffering. She is a robust, beautiful, wonderful orca who comes to you right away. She recognizes the people. But the more you get to know her and you learn about her health history, we learned how, you know, how, in, how, in, how in ill health she was. And she was, when we came in, in 2021, the US Department of Agriculture had reported that she was very sick and potentially dying. And the park wouldn't talk to anyone, the owners of that park. Park is for Unidas, owned the park in 2021. 
but there was a rumor that the park was being sold. And it was sold to the Dolphin Company, which owns some 39 dolphin parks around the world, but they never had an orca. So we were able to open a dialogue with that new owner about the orca. And his daughters, he tells the story, his daughters had told him he shouldn't have that orca. It's too small a tank. So he came in with a predisposition to help that orca, but had no resources to do so. So we were able to convince him that we could bring in independent veterinarians to assess the health of that animal. And he agreed to let that happen. First time ever that I'm aware of that a bunch of animal crazy people were able to come into a marine park bring in independent veterinarians who were well known to be cetacean vets and orca vets to evaluate an animal while that animal was under the ownership of the park. So that was unique. And through that process, we developed trust with the owners. And then we're able to bring in a team of trainers and a team of caregivers and take over the care of that animal full time in the park's premises, but with our team. Then they had water quality problems, so we replaced the chillers, we replaced the filters, spent three quarters of a million dollars from one donor who was committed to doing this to repair all of their infrastructure so it could maintain salinity and temperature. And that's what it would do. We need to keep the temperature at about 57 degrees. You'd like to have 30 parts per thousand on salinity. So we keep those parameters. And then over time, the idea was to return that animal to where she had been caught in 1970 in Washington State. And there was an indigenous population for whom the orca are their relatives who live beneath the sea and they wanted to bring her home. So a coalition was created for all of that. Now, it didn't work, she died a month ago. But she had, I believe, the highest quality of life she might have had in recent years because of all that attention, we were able to provide for her with this team of experts that basically lived with her full time. So it's a sad story, but also it's a story that shows what we have to do with each of these circumstances, with each of these animals that will be in different states of health, different states of condition of their environments, and the need for them the need for them to get out, if you will, in the cases we've mentioned and shown you, is critically important. And building this sanctuary becomes a symbol for this to happen throughout the world. And so yes, we can only handle eight or so many animals, but it shows that it can be done. And it demonstrates the importance of doing it soon. So that's why we feel we're at a moment now and why we've added staff and why we're building and why we're expanding so that we can meet that need in every way. So, thank you. Thank you. You know how to reach Lori and me. Now you know how to reach Matt and Alexandra, and we recommend you reach them and leave us alone. No. <laughs> so, questions, concerns, comments? Where are we on a couple things? One thing I should mention, you know, we, we are going through these terms and conditions on the lease. Among the terms and conditions are input from neighbors and how the neighbors relate to this project. So we do have to work our way through that. There are some very serious concerns by the people most impacted by the project are those who live next to it. Those are issues that have to be resolved and dealt with. Ideally, a project like this would have unanimous support from everyone. It doesn't have to have that because the agencies deal with different dissidents among projects all the time. But ideally, you would have unanimous consent. That's not something I think we have at this point. There are some strong issues. We just simply have to continue to figure out ways, if we can, to help them, to solve them, and, and proceed to do so. But those are strong, those are real issues that we do have to understand that exist 
in a project of this nature as we go through that lease process as well as the permitting process. Okay. Questions? Comments? Yes. Hi. Mike Newell, I live at the cottage near 16 Walter Cove Road. So we come to the meeting tonight, I was thinking there'll be a meeting, it was a pitch again, right? You know, we went through the whole thing, right? You know, I want to know where you stood on what's going on down there. There's nothing going on down there, right? No, Except what, you're what, what's going on down there? No, Mike? you're out looking for no, whales. What's, what's going on down there, Mike, is all the, all the environmental work that we just described that has to get done during this period. Correct. So that's what's going on. And as, you fi as we finish that work, then the results get presented, and then we figure out the strategies that we have to do or simply provide the reports to the government. So that is necessary before any construction can take place. I got you. Okay, then. But, so you're out looking for a whale. It, went, it all went fast. So there's a whale in a tank that's cracked. You got to get out of there. There's no way you can bring them here right now, right? So no, no. to me, that's a pipe dream right now. Like you're putting a cart before the horse, right? You know what I mean? But anyway, just getting back and everything else there. So, uh, I don't know. I just don't know. The, the right. road going down there is not suitable for anything. I do not want my tax money in the condition that Nova Scotia's in right now to be fixing that road for a whale sanctuary down there, right? Mm -hmm. um, the land around Bearswell Bay, right. Cove, do you own all that land around there? Around the Cove? Correct. No, that's the, the land around the Cove is, is owned by other families than the 30 acres that we have under option. The 30 acres we have under option is the wharf and the area going to the north from the wharf. Up around the right coming around the cove, the little pond we there. Do not. That's yeah. right. So these land owners there, mm -hmm. they have no way to get out with a boat out of their kayak or anything. If we you were block if, all if that we were, up. If we were, you have their permission. If we were to net across from the wharf to Bearishwap Island, that would be a barrier from the cove. So the families, there are three families that own land other than the land we have they would be either able to access it across the isthmus if it was a kayak, but they would not be able to go out of the cove into the bay. So that is precisely the concern that they, among so others, that they have. You can actually road. block a marine access like that? Just from, the, from the Department of Transport, Transport in Canada, yes. Wow. Because it's not, I don't think you could do that up in the approaches of the Alpine it's, it's not considered navigable water. That the cove is not considered navigable water. That doesn't mean it's not important to the family. So the boats there. that come in there now and come into that, the, that, the that two they're not boat? navigating the water? Two, the two fishing boats? The two fishing boats. Over the years, there's been a few more. Yeah, and I've been, actually yeah. seen sailboats dock there. Right. The right. sailboat comes in and docks during some of the storms from... No, 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 it was a resident that come right. every once in a while. And so the, the fishing boats, the fishermen who, Huey and Thane, have agreed that they would move I'm not their, saying their that, boats. I know that. Pardon? I asked, they're not a navigate boat, because you say it's no, not navigating No, that's not what I water. said. That's not what I said. What I said is the Department of the Transport Canada doesn't consider the cove to be navigable water. What I did, the, in terms of the two fishing boats, if they wanted, they have agreed that they would move where they move, moor those boats. Short of that, that would be a serious problem, but both of them have agreed that they would move because they think the project has that level of importance for the community. So it, they've made that fine. decision I mean, you're, you're missing my point. So okay. once What's, they move, then it's not navigable waters anymore. But now that they're, they're still right. there, it's navigable water. I can't pronounce it. Water. Yeah. If with the lease that we would have, we would be enabled to net off that section of the water. That's correct. And that would be a barrier for people wanting to move out of the cove. Now, as I say, Transport Canada, they say that's okay. That doesn't mean the other agencies do. That just happens to be Transport Canada because they're 
guidelines around what types of boats to move. There's one my boat in there. There around the other agencies, then it's the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables that deals with what the lease conditions are, and it's the lease conditions where the issue you're raising is, is a listed issue. So that's the issue we've discussed with the neighbors and understand their concerns and their lack of support for it. So that's clear, and it it's, does fall, doesn't have to fall under Transport Canada, it falls under Department of Natural Resources. That's right. But it's still there. It doesn't mean it goes away as a problem. I, I just have problems with the whole issue. I don't want tourists down there all the time. You know, I've already voiced my complaints on that many times. You probably recognize me. And and like I say, that road from pretty well the whole gravel road, if you're going to do construction like this down there, that's going to have to be rebuilt. Right? That road from Sonora in on the dirt road and, and then past my place is not even, that's probably not even up to a code past my place. Right. It is to a code probably for my place out. But you, you think of all your construction going down there. Where's all that funding coming from? From the private, from all of our funding. Comes so you're going to pave or, or rebuild Sonora Dirt Road from there to there whenever it needs to be done when your machinery tears it all up? You're paying for that? First of all, to come back to your earlier point, this is not a road that tourists will use. We've already provided the point that there is not a, there is not a tourist attraction here. Yeah, but you were going to build walking trails. So we're not, the no, we're, what, we've, we've agreed, what we've agreed is not to do that for the public in order to respond to the concerns for traffic. Okay, well, even so beyond all that, then just construction. Right. Just construction. So most of the construction of all the nets, all of that work is done by barge and comes in by barge. All of it comes in separately for our lawyer. From, from all, no, not for the buildings. I'm saying for the nets. That's what I'm asking, sir. Yeah. So if the road gets all tore up, who's paying for it? And who's going to rebuild the road from where I say, from Walters Cove Road down to the wharf, which is probably not even up to a code? I do not want my tax money paying for that. This province has a homeless prob or problem. We have people get living on the streets. Apartments are... They don't need to be wasting this money on your pipe dream. Okay. I do not think this will ever happen. I think you're just wasting every, now you have more employees, no offense to you new people, none whatsoever, you're perfect. But I think, I, I'm really, and then to come here, I wanted to have a meeting, I want to know what was going on. I didn't want to go through all these pictures again. 45 minutes, I went through this, this is the third time. I think it's lovely but I don't think you're in the right spot. I've talked to people from Sheet Harbor. They drove to my cabin from Sheet Harbor, and that man was pretty upset at the likes of you people, what you tried to do with Sheet Harbor, till they drove you out. Now you're coming down here. I know I'm only a season, seasonal person. My wife has owned the property, her family's owned the property forever, right? Like I say, it's a good project. It's the wrong spot. It's the wrong spot. When you came up with this to this village here, you said Port Hilford, Port Hilford, a paved truck route, not a dirt road going to a wharf that two fishermen run, the shacks, the wharf, everything is run down. The governments don't own any of that anymore, right? Sure, they're going to say yes, no offense there either thing, but it is what it is. But I think you're in the wrong spot and uh, and, and That's I, all I got to say. And I, and I appreciate your point of view, and I respect it. it, it but I also respect other points of view and want to do what's possible. And going through all the procedures, both from the federal and the provincial side, is what we're doing. And I think there are ways to respond to the concerns you have and still do the project and do it in a way that makes sense. So I think there are ways we can work together. The road issues can be solved. How? We work, we work How? By fixing I know road, what's happened with my tax money, to. and I, I I can tell you right now. I, where's your MLA for here? I don't see him sitting in the room. Why? 
Where's your provincial government guy sitting in your room? Is there anybody here that, you know, do they even know what's going on? We've met with all of them. We continually meet with them. And frankly, they are supportive of the project. But you There you can, go. But so you I can feel can, the money coming out of but, my pocket now. You too can be meeting with them. It's not a one-way street. And, and certainly you yeah, should Yeah, but you be. guys come in here and you talk all this. And the next thing, you got a, a $50 million grant to fix the road, right? Not and meanwhile, there's people starving in the province. I'm Fifty, not aware you know, that we have a road to go I'm to not aware that we have a grant from I've never said that building. now. I never said that you did. I could see it in the writing. I've, I've been around. I know what governments are like. They love our money, right? And they love to make it look good in the news. Right. Well, I appreciate the point of view. And as I say, I think there are ways around it. The same way we, you know, originally we did talk about let's have walking trails through it and the like. We heard the concerns about that. We said, okay, we won't do that. And we won't have a visitor center there. So we have been responsive to that kind of concern. And we will continue to be responsive in every way we can. But we also do think this is an ideal spot for the animals. And we want to continue to try to work through all of the issues that exist and solve them in ways that are constructive and responsive and don't take taxpayer dollars. Well, I think I read somewhere that Marineland even said that it wasn't a good spot. Sorry, I'm so. asking if you need some space for some other yeah, maybe we Okay, that's fine. Thank, Thank you for your time. My name's Roger. I'm, I'm also a seasonal guy. I was just curious. Um, a lot of, I'm, I'm from Western Canada, and um, I've seen a lot of projects occur, and a lot of projects cost money. They take time, so what I'm seeing is not surprising. Um, Money has a way to solve a lot of problems, as this gentleman was saying. You've got real issues with it. Can you tell us a little bit about your funding? Sure. Yeah, so all of our funding is from private sector individuals, foundations, and individuals. So we've raised, uh, we have in escrow roughly a million dollars for the land side work, some of the marine work. We received a grant at the end of 2022 for another $5 million from one of our key donors. This is a woman we know well. She has the capacity actually to fund all of it should she choose to do so. And we have a number of other major donors of seven figures. Now, this is roughly a $12 million project. So we, we don't have all of the money yet, but we do have contacts with a number of donors that we believe can provide the rest of that. How quickly? We have to demonstrate that. And obviously, same reason we haven't exercised the option for the private land, because it would be bad business to exercise the private land option before we've got the rest of the money to do it all. I can say the individual who just funded all the work in Miami could fund all of this and then some multiple times over. Is he prepared to do that? I don't think so. He was in love with that animal. Part of the reason why we talk about the animals People are not really in fun uh, in love with dirt. It's hard to get people to fund dirt. They want to fund animals. They want to save specific animals. So why is it cart before horse? It's cart and horse together. In order so people identify with specific animals, and then you work the timing with the owners of those parks so that they coincide with the timing for the animals to move and the project to be done. Is it an easy process? Of course not. But is it a doable process? Absolutely. It takes the kind of coordination and planning and meeting that you have to do, just like you do in any other project. But that's why you start talking about the animals now when you're still doing dirt. So are you really any closer than you were this time last year? Yes, we've, for, we've, gotten, these we've gotten these permits or leases through, or whatever. Yeah, we've gotten through all of this additional environmental work that we hadn't been able to do. But you we don't know the results of it yet. We do know that it, it has. You, said uh, you did. No, I said we don't have all the results. You got to listen to the whole sentence occasionally. I know it's difficult, but you really do. And um, oh. don't be rude. It's, oh, yeah, that's rude. It's, don't be rude. And that goes both ways. Yeah, all right. And so we have results for all the land work that we've done. And we understand where there are 
residue from the gold mines mm -hmm. and the mitigation strategy for dealing with that. Now we're getting the results from the submerged soils and as we get these results, we got some today, we'll get some in a month from what they tell us. We then develop the mitigation strategy for the submerged soils. There's mitigation required in both, not surprising, and it's done elsewhere in the province where there has been gold mining and where there are any metals left from the gold mine. So on the land, it's a capping process, which wherever you're gonna put a building, you either put a layer of sand, you put a layer of gravel, and or a layer of concrete where you're putting buildings. Where you don't have people on the land using it for building or other uses, you can leave it where it, the way it is. So that only has to be mitigated in the areas where you're doing construction. All of that, all of our construction is really right in the area just as you, if you were turning to the wharf, if you turn to the left, where Thane used to have his uh, storage building. That area is the main area for all of that construction. And that area is a buildable site and can be dealt with. The submerged soils, we are just learning to find whether there are any issues, what those issues are, and then what the mitigation strategy would be for them. And those two, we look to the people who've already done this kind of mitigation throughout the province. Every time there's a marina built, Every time there's anything built in the water, they go through the same issues. So we're, we'd have to go through those as well. So will there still be a viewing tower? Viewing tower, we would like for staff. It's only for staff, yes, it's staff. not for the public. It's for the staff to be able to see the whales from a height that gives you perspective. So you're not gonna break tourists in? No, 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 no. You wouldn't want tourists climbing up that tower anyway. Well, in the but this, I mean, that's, if you think of that, it was, it was always designed as like you would have for a forest viewing platform. That kind of vibe solely for staff to get a perspective on the whole 100 acres. So if you have to cap off these, this soil that's... Uh, on the land side, yeah. If you have to cap it off, that cement truck's coming in with cement, right? It can be, it can be gravel, same, same deal though, from a truck standpoint. Yeah, You've got gravel, or around. sometimes it's dirt. And sometimes it's dredge spoils that are put on top if we're doing any dredging for other reasons. That was done before that. They did a whole lot of dredging throughout that area and the dredge spoils were put up on the land in that area. So that was done previously. Yeah. That's been suggested to us again as a possibility, but we don't have that plan yet as a, as a final plan. But wouldn't that, the soil that's already been dredged out, wouldn't that be contaminated too? That's the, that's the question. I, it's, it's, from what we've seen, there are spots that are directly related to where the stamp mill was, but the area as a whole is not, is not, doesn't seem to have those issues. But again, we gotta get more, we gotta get that data, and that's why we did the sampling. Yes, other questions, comments, concerns, complaints? Okay. Can't run by the other one complaining. Go ahead, yes. No, my name's Crystal, and uh, I've been a seasonal almost my whole life down in Wine Harbor. Now I'm a permanent resident. And during the last hurricane, I spent a lot of time down there by the wharf, just watching the waves and the water and stuff like that. My question is: these, all these, whether they're the orcas or they're the belugas, they're all coming from pools, right? Like like a an aquarium. Mm -hmm. So. And then you go and you put them in something that you cannot keep control of the temperature right. with the pressure of the hurricane coming. Like the last hurricane wasn't that bad. Right. And the waves can get a lot worse. So how do you protect them from that when they're not used to that? It's a, it's a great question. And all I, what I can respond to is my own experience with where we took Keiko, the free willy whale, from Mexico City to Oregon, Oregon to Iceland, put him in Iceland, actually in the same day where those belugas are, and we had horrendous weather. 120 knot winds would clock around that bay that we were in. It was also cold. I have pictures of me with ice hanging down the beard, hanging on to people who try not to get blown off. The whale loved it. They, he just loved that experience. It was the worst of weather, the more it was enriching for him 
because it was natural. Now, it doesn't happen on day one. That's why you want to bring animals in the spring. You want to get used to the water. The variety of temperature is, a, is an issue, but it's actually stimulating. The environment where they are is static, and they're bored, so they log on the surface. They don't do a lot unless they're in a pro show or a performance. But the more you provide them with enrichment, the more the environment is naturally enriching, the more they become engaged with it. So in fact, what we've seen, and that's the only thing we can base it on, as well as the science, but what we've seen, the behaviors, is they respond to that variety, and they're not as impacted by some of the concerns as we would be as humans. And just to add to that, um, most of the time in, in the wild, when there's a terrible storm, they dive. <laughs> and they spend a lot of time under the water. Um, and in tanks, they don't have the ability to do that. So <coughs> we're giving them this an opportunity to use a, a natural mechanism for dealing with wind and waves and all kinds of things in, in weather if they don't want to, they just die. And one of the things with that that's, that's interesting is they're not used to going below the water. I mean, they're natural in the wild. They spend more, much more of their time underwater than above. In a tank, because they're only dealing with people, they spend all their time like this. They also get sunburned eyes a lot of the time, depending on where they're fed and whether the sun is coming down at them. So part of what you're doing as you bring them to a sanctuary is conditioning them to get used to that environment again, or in some cases, for the first time. So you do things like feed them underwater rather than above water. You do all kinds of techniques to get them used to using that whole environment. When you bring them the first time, you don't put them in 100 acres. You put them in a smaller area of five or 10. And then over time, you expand that so they have the repertoire and the use of the whole facility. But they have to get used to that. And part of it is getting used to the weather. But in the main, what, just what I've seen is they love it. It's just so nice. And the, the birds on the surface, they'll chase birds. They just want to be active. I noticed you didn't talk about timelines as far as completion or anything tonight. So I was just wondering. True. No, it's always a good question. And I always, I always give, the same, I always give the same answer and I'm always wrong. Like three years ago. So I'm yeah, so I mean, three years, years ago I said next year. Yes. Years. So now I'm going to say next year. Yeah. I mean, so it's, you've heard it again. But I mean, it, it does, I think we are, where are we? What's different this year, and you asked the question earlier, Maureen, it's the right question. What's different now than last year? Well, what's different is we've gotten through so much of that work and now can be working on resolving the issues that exist. Now, time-wise, would still be, would be wonderful to be able to bring whales in by the end of 2024. So it's exactly the same thing you've heard me say before when it was the end of 2023. So that's still possible depending on both the funding and moving through the, the last of these permits. The permits, I think, are relatively straightforward. The funding, of course, has to come in. We have the right people to talk to, but it does have to come in. Would we bring a whale in in December of 2024? No. The weather's too bad. You wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to push it to the spring for the reasons we've already talked about. So you have to balance those things out as well. Mike, yeah, go ahead. No offense, but it'll be 2024 before you get the road up the code to even start <laughs> to build down there, sir. Okay. Think about what you're looking at. Do you even drive down that road? I do. Like, there's rocks. And, like, I'm not talking a rock. Too. There's There's a shelf, uh, like a rock lead shelf in that road that would have to either be manufactured or whatever. And you're going to tell people... I'd like to put a whale there in 2024. Sorry, sir. I just don't get that. You have to be an optimist. So yeah, that, it would take 2024 to build the pad to cover up your goo to put your building on. <laughs> would it not? I work at the port in Halifax, and I'm time. watching them put fill in the harbor, right? 
and they got to put in certain dirt there in the salt water so it doesn't uh, leach and run off and stuff. They cover it with salt water. Right. It's it a big sense. process. No question. And over at the, by Africville Park, with the dump there, it's the same issue. It's a big money maker. Who's paying for all this? You just don't cover over this dirt. You got to really what you call mitigated, like. That's an odd extra cost on your establishment, on that's your It's an extra cost. There's big no time. Big time. Yeah, that's anyway, thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you for your, all your answers, though. Anyway, I do, and do I, appreciate I, and, and it. And I appreciate the concern. I recognize it. And it's important that you voice it. But I wouldn't tell people well. sitting here, 2024. I, that, to me, no, you're putting yourself on a ledge there, bud. I've been on that ledge before, though, from these same people, so they know that, you know, I, I'm going to always push that envelope as far as I can. And part of it is, if you don't push that envelope, it never happens. <coughs> so you have to try to push that envelope as, as much as you can and not be terribly concerned when things happen that are un, unplanned. And they will. They have in this project numerous times. They may again, but it's still, and Lori said it an hour ago, look at 130 sites in North America, British Columbia, Washington State, and here. And this is a spectacular site for doing this. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any issues. It doesn't mean it doesn't have problems and horrendous cost. And it's still worth doing. I think the concern is, you guys are concerned about the whales and their environment. Mm -hmm. We're concerned about our environment. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's, and right. that's the whole bottom line. No, and that's important. You know, and it is. And my, I, I, my I, tax I, money. I put my boat in down there. I won't be able to put my boat there no more. Right? And you put your boat in the cove? Yes. I have for years. I have for 50 years. And, and what kind of boat is it? It's a small fishing boat. Yeah. Yeah. I have concerns. I you understand. Know. Yeah. Those those are real. But I the think concerns it's all, it's about all traffic about, are real. You know, you guys are concerned about, about the whales, we're concerned about our environment. Sure. It's gonna change the whole wine harbor situation. You know what I mean? It's going everything is gonna change there. As soon as construction starts, the whole circumstances are gonna change. We're a little change. family down there. I understand. That's yeah, our sanctuary. Sure. And yeah, it's our sanctuary and you're gonna you're worried about whale sanctuary. No, I understand, and that, that's and that's real, and that's important. That's that's all. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. We are certainly here. Uh, I'll be here all week. We just got to move to get to teach class at NYU on Wednesday, so she she's got to get there. But I'll be here all week. Certainly, Alexander's always here. Amy, Matt, be in and out. You know how to find us. If you have individual questions, please do contact us. We do want to have a dialogue. We recognize that there are some issues, and we'd like to try to solve them in a respectful and, and 